at the University of Freiburg in Freiburg, West Germany with Professor uh, F.A. Hayek, the author of uh, many famous books and uh, undoubtedly one of the world's uh, uh, greatest living economists. In fact, many of us in the free market move movement or hard money movement would say that uh, Professor Hayek is definitely the world's greatest living economist. It's a, a particular pleasure for me to be here uh, doing the interview personally because uh, Professor Hayek had a great influence on my uh, uh, early understanding the free market system and how it works and my reading of his uh, work since then, since then has heavily influenced uh, my uh, uh, understanding of free market economics, uh, etc. So it's a pleasure to be here and I'd like to ask you, uh, Professor, my first question. Uh, I wonder if the, since our audience um, is, is mainly interested, or at least uh, very greatly interested in the theory of money and how it affects their investments, etc. Um, I wonder if we could talk for a minute about how money evolved uh, without uh, the uh, uh, the help of governments, into, and in present times it seems very much the hindrance of money from government interference. Um, uh, Carl Minger talked about the evolution of money as a sort of a natural phenomenon. Um, how did money come about and what's happened today to, to, to mess up things so much? See, the great trouble is the money wasn't allowed to develop further. After two or three hundred years of coins, all governments put their hands and stopped any further developments. You were not allowed to experiment on it. Money hasn't been improved. Money have be, has rather become worse in the course of time. Because unlike, see, you refer to Menger, and it's quite true that Menger and before him Hume and Mandeville uh, made law, language, money, the three paradigms of spontaneously grown institutions. Now, fortunately, law and language have been allowed to develop. Money has originated in original form, but as soon as it was there in its most primitive form, it was frozen. Government said it must not develop any further. And what we have had since in development were matters of government inventions, mostly wrong, mostly abuses of money. And I have come to the position of asking, has monetary policy ever done any good? I don't think it has. I think it has done only harm. And that's why I am now pleading for what I've called denationalization of money. Uh, not in this book. Uh, I hope I will live long enough after finishing this book to write another book on money, which is very urgent, but at the moment my moral issues seem to be more important even than the monetary problems. And more fundamental, yes, I would agree. But to stick on the money subject just for a minute, I'll never forget uh, it was at our conference, the National Committee for Monetary Reform Conference in Lausanne, Switzerland, at the beautiful Borovage Hotel, where you first introduced this theory of competition and currencies. In an excellent speech that was very well received and since has been printed into a pamphlet form and then a miniature, uh, then a, a small book. Uh, <clears throat> we earlier, before when we were chatting, I showed you that in the uh, uh, recent edition of Fortune magazine, even Fortune magazine has picked up on discussing this uh, this uh, controversial uh, theory of competition of currencies. Uh, yeah. Let me ask you, how do you uh, <clears throat> how do you think that it would uh, work? Would would the major banks such as uh, Chase Manhattan issue currencies or, or, or would there be gold coins issued or how would it? No, I still believe that my original plan is right, but I'm afraid I've come to the conclusion that politically it's completely utopian. Governments will never allow and even bankers do not understand the idea because bankers have all grown up in a system in which they are so completely dependent on central banks, government institutions, as lenders of last resort, that after many experiments, there's hardly a banker who will understand even what I am arguing. So I may now be revealing half a secret. I am devising a roundabout way. Uh, after all, in the modern world, hand-to-hand -hand money, mm -hmm. coins 
and paper is no longer the most important. Uh, credits and credit cards paper. are a substitute. Where the governments can stop people from issuing money, they can hardly stop them from opening accounts in something, unless they introduce a complete system of exchange control. Mm -hmm. uh, except, as I said before, I do not expect that any bank will understand it. But there are other people who are suitable for it. Sure. My hope is now that one of the big dealers in the raw materials mm -hmm. will prepare to open accounts which we he will redeem in so much of current monies as are necessary to buy this list of raw materials. Only in the form of accounts, right. which he pays out in whatever currencies are really needed, or in any currency enough to buy this list of raw materials, ah, which will make his unit, call it uh, the solid, the standard unit without ever being used in circulation. People will very soon begin to keep their accounts in solid, the only thing which is trustworthy. It's also a thing where many people can compete. Most of them will probably choose the same list. If one of the big men has started this, right. others will imitate it. So I think we can forget about existing money and existing banks and we gladly open a system of accounts which will displace money. Ah, that is, that's, a, that's a fascinating concept. Maybe the unit one day will be known as the Hayek. <laughs> uh, on, continuing on just for a minute uh, on the uh, money issue, it occurs to me that the fundamental uh, flaw in uh, Friedman's theory of uh, monetary control uh, is becoming more and more evident today. We have electronic transfer of money, we have credit card money, we have comp complicated com uh, uh, computerized analysis of the money supply, yet uh, in spite and because of these things, the federal authorities are, are even admitting that they don't even know what the money supply is. They can't put their finger on it. Exactly. So how, how in the world could you have a, uh, a theory based on a tight definition of increasing the money supply at a particular rate, which varies from time to time, if you don't know what, that, what the fundamental money supply is? You know, about 40 years ago, I once wrote a sentence something like this. One of the worst things which could happen would be if mankind ever forgot the quantity of money, except they should ever take it literally. <laughs> <laughs> and that's why I still believe. It is true that the price level is determined from the quantity of money, but we never know what the quantity of money in this sense is. No. I think the rule ought to be that whatever issues the money must adapt the quantity so that the price level will remain stable. Mm. But to believe that there is a measurable magnitude which you can keep constant with beneficial effects, I regard as completely wrong. Yeah, I agree with I mean, you. I will add, you see, I don't like criticizing Milton Friedman, not only because he's an old friend, because outside monetary theory we are in complete agreement. Oh, he's an excellent Our general view on what is desirable and what is not was almost identical till we get on to money. But if I told him what I mentioned before, that I very much doubt whether monetary policy has ever done anything good, <laughs> he personally is convinced that a good monetary policy is a foundation for everything. I think. Well, it's, uh, it, it certainly leads to my next question, and that is, in light of the um the total uh, mismanagement of money by uh, governments, uh, government control over money in the central banks. Uh, in light of this, the uh, uh, the third world debt crisis, the huge buildup of loans. At last count, there was something on the order of six hundred billion dollars loaned to the third world countries. In light of this uh, uh, terrible situation, still being controlled, or or uh, uh, at least the central banks claim to be controlling it. Uh, in light of all that, what do you think is the outcome for the third world debt crisis, as it's being called? What, what do you see as the outcome? I don't know. If we are very lucky, and I doubt whether we should be as lucky, we may get through it without either a resumption of inflation or new controls being clapped on. I don't quite see how it can be done, but I still hope it may be done. But uh, 
The only good thing I hope to see is that people are becoming somewhat aware that the present monetary system is not really satisfactory, and that we will have to consider very fundamental reform. I don't think anybody is yet going far enough. I much sympathize with the people who would like to return to the gold standard. I wish it were possible. I'm personally convinced it cannot be done for two reasons. A, the gold standard presupposes certain dogmatic beliefs which mm -hmm. cannot be rationally justified. <coughs> and our present generation is not prepared to readopt beliefs which were old traditions and have been discredited. But even more serious, I believe that any return any attempt to return to gold would lead to such fluctuations in the value of gold that for that reason it would break down. So although I much sympathize with the gold standard people, okay. I don't believe that is a possible way. I think in the long run, only my much more radical proposal, how we get over the trans transition period, I don't know. It, it's certainly a difficult question. It seems to me that uh, that your solution um, or some type of solution that gets money back to a stable uh, uh, valuation so people can trust money is, is absolutely fundamental to the survival of a, of a free Western civilization. And, and what's um, discouraging is that, as you say, the likelihood of adapting your very, very radical proposal is probably um, uh, 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 only very, very slight, at least at this time. And then on the other side, the idea of returning to any sort of gold standard, I agree with you, doesn't seem to be politically feasible. And if we continue in the present situation with these massive uh, budget deficits uh, and continuation of uh, inflation, it seems to me um, uh, that, that the, the only outlook seems to be for a continuation of the status quo, ups and downs, but basically long-term currency depreciation. So which leads I may interrupt you a moment. Uh, I hesitate to speak about it because it involves another frightfully important problem which I have been much interested in, which I haven't studied. It's the whole question of the supposed necessary help to the underdeveloped countries. Mm -hmm. Now, I believe some such help ought to be brought, but I have argued 40 years ago that it ought to be taken not in the form of government-to-government -government help, but in the form of private investment governments only coming in in the form of guaranteeing free repayment of capital and the returns of such mm. investments. That I argue, surely enough, not with regards to the underdeveloped countries, but with regards to the post-war help of the United States to Europe. <laughs> I think the same principle <laughs> applies to the underdeveloped countries. I don't think Governments ought to give a penny to other governments. They can help private enterprise by guaranteeing against political risks, which essentially involves the problem of free transfer of returns and capital. Uh, there we could exercise a very considerable pressure because it would stop giving such guarantee to any country who has failed beforehand. Right. That, that, uh, it, and that seems to be the root of the problem because it looks like most of these third world countries, uh, uh, even the larger countries with a sizable economic base and a huge amount of natural resources like Brazil, will, be in, it, will, will really find it impossible to, to repay these debts, at least in the short term. Well, no, one more thing. Effective help can only be given if it's according to the sensibility of the political system. This Correct. distinction governments cannot make, <laughs> but private industry can make. Uh, agreed, agreed. Uh, but since we have this system, that, I mean, th this system that isn't working well now, uh, and, it, and, and the, it, it looks like if you examine the fundamentals that the long-term uh, uh, outlooks tends to be for more and more currency depreciation, I know that that um, um, uh, Ludwig von Mises once said uh, in a tricky little quote, 
He said government is the only agency that can take a useful commodity like paper, slap some ink on it, and make it totally worthless. Uh, yes, indeed. It seems like to me, examining the fundamentals, that that's probably the longer term outlook. It, but that's my personal uh, 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 idea of how the scenario will develop. Nobody knows for sure. But in general, without getting into all the specifics, I know we don't really have time now, but do you see the future as being more and more inflation and currency depreciation, or do you think that we could have a massive depression because of the government's mismanagement of money? Many of the things have, in the last two years, moved very much better than I hoped. That, uh, particularly in England, Ms. Thatcher would be able to bring inflation down as low as she has done. And the same, to some extent, in America is very encouraging. If they can bring down inflation to zero and stay there, I think the position of the leading countries can be saved. But I'm not sure that means the position of their banks can be saved. <laughs> <laughs> they are not no longer mainly dependent on the economy of their own country. And, um, well, uh, I have nightmares about the possible banking crisis, but I don't like to talk about it because I haven't studied current yeah. affairs sufficiently. Many of the, our um, attendees that come to our conferences uh, and have been coming to our conferences for years tend to be a, 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 ahead of their time, at least uh, they have for the last 10 years, in the sense that they um, go contrary to, uh, to current investment thinking. Uh, and. They years and years ago were one of the first um, the groups of investors to understand that in periods of long-term currency depreciation, gold is a good investment, and they owned a little gold in, in, as a hedge in the same way Europeans have for years. Uh, today, uh, all of uh, our attendees are asking themselves the, the question, re-examining their case for gold. D do you really think, in light of the present trends, um, uh, that you could say for the long-term holding? Uh, which would, you, would would government paper money be a better long term holding uh, no, or certainly, gold? Certainly not. I mean, that's a wholly different issue. It's the investment issue from the what is desirable as money. I myself, I can't say I invest on a large scale in gold, but my ultimate reserves are gold coins <laughs> of a certain number. I mean, everything should go wrong, and that would be something. But that doesn't mean it's a good money. Because this is a long-term situation, right. doesn't secure in the least that a money, a gold money will be stable in the short term. I think in the present situation it will be very unstable money. No. It, 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 I, I particularly uh, so because of the uh, chance that the price of gold could go up dramatically in price, or that it could go, uh, it could drop dramatically as it mm -hmm. has in the last uh, several months. Do, do you uh, have have you been reading about and does the, does the the huge size of the U.S. budget deficits uh, oh, yes, discouraged you. Yeah. You know, it, I just read uh, today's uh, Herald Tribune that uh, that the it's U.S. budget. I, I read this every day. <laughs> <laughs> the, the U.S. budget deficit is going to be over 200 billion for fiscal 83, and it's uh, there was an interesting. I don't know if you saw the little clipping on this, but the uh, President Reagan uh, had a commission study the deficit problem, government debt problem, the Grace Commission, it was called. And they came up with some pretty shocking predictions that the deficit could grow to three, four, five hundred bi uh, billion dollars, and, and even toward the end of the century, over a trillion dollars. What, what, what impact would this have on the U.S. dollar in foreign exchange markets and vis-a-vis -vis other real, not not other, but real uh, goods and services? <laughs> down, <laughs> down dramatically. Yeah. yeah. Well, all the more need for uh, uh, your sound uh, oh, surely, uh, monetary sir. reform. I don't believe that we should ever have a good money again before we take the thing out of the hands of government. We can't take them violently out of the hands of government. All we can do is, by some sly roundabout way, <laughs> introduce something they can't stop. Um, what, what do you think is the major problem or major threat to Western civilization on a very fundamental question? Is it, is it do you fear uh, or do you think the main problem or threat to Western uh, free uh, civilization is uh, a third world war, a, a confrontation between the Soviet Union and the United States, or the economic and 
political area. No, the main danger is pacifism. Uh, that the West may be so in, become so inferior in power that one Russian threat after another will force it to go into a direction which it doesn't want. I do not believe in the danger of an atomic war. At least I don't think it will break up between, break out between the major powers. Whether if Mr. Gaddafi gets an atomic bomb or somebody, that might cause dreadful effects. But I think both sides are intelligent enough to use it as a threat, but not actually to use it. Incidentally, I would say atomic war was not a war. It's the end of civilization, yes. nothing yes. else. Uh, but the danger of Russia becoming so much stronger as by her threats forcing the West not only to make concession to her, but modify its own system on mm. the Russian style is a very, very serious one. That's and right. I would rely on yeah. a maximum, not in the expectation that I ever use my arms, but that's the only way to be able to say when the Russians demand something new. I don't think the Russians will be foolish enough to begin a war against the strong opponents. So you would favor the uh, the, the rearmament um, uh, of uh, the United States uh, that Reagan has proposed and that and the deployment of cruise missiles in Europe, uh, that type of thing? Certainly, so far yeah. as I can judge the strategic importance, my impression of this, this is absolutely essential. Yeah. And I'm great galant, particularly by the European pacifist movements. Yes. Um, I believe you knew uh, Lord John Maynard uh, uh, Keynes oh, yes. uh, and, and actually taught with him uh, at the same university, did, did you not? Well, uh, I taught at his university while he was advising government. <laughs> <laughs> See, the, my London School of Economics was evacuated to Cambridge for the whole war period. Awesome. And Keynes got me rooms in his college. Oh, that's a fascinating but he story. was most of the time advising government, so we met only occasionally on weekends. We are personally very good friends. You have not seen my 100th uh, birthday article in The Economist about him? I did see that, and I was going to ask you about that. That was reprinted quite a lot and passed around in free market circles <laughs> in the United States. That was very interesting. Um, what, do you think that many of his ideas were sound, but yet uh, uh, they were misused? Because in his later years, and I may be incorrect in this, I'm certainly not a scholar, but in later years I believe he wrote that uh, about grave concern that some of his ideas that he had uh, come up with were being misused by governments. Well, he had the illusion that a little inflation is good, <laughs> much not. You know, he was one of the cleverest men I knew. But he was not really a very competent economist at all. He had strong intuitions, which sometimes were right, and strong conviction that he could get any get get over any theory which he invented to justify his particular <laughs> recommendations. Uh, he was in a way a great man, but I don't think he was a great economist. I, I think that maybe he was a great investor. I've heard that he was a very excellent investor from time to time. He had major losses, but I read in an article the other day that uh, in recent papers that came out about him it's, uh, that in the 1930s he made 60 times his money in the stock market. Uh, well, I have to qualify it slightly, and I can quote him literally. He confessed to me. When I speculated in currency, I went back broke. When I turned to commodities, not stock market, yeah. I made, uh, I think, half a million pounds then. Yeah, that's fascinating. That was a tremendous and amount of money. And the same amount for his college. Yeah, that was a tremendous amount of money. He I must have made two million pounds in the pre-war uh, pound values. Oh, that's, that was, that, that, I also read in this article that he was a, that he was a contrarian in the sense that he would look and see what was the the uh, uh, the predominant uh, opinion of all the establishment investment advisors and bankers, and then go do the exact opposite. But I didn't know this story, but it sounds very much like. Him. Uh, well, I, Professor Hayek, thank you. It's it's been a pleasure and an honor to be here uh, at the university for this interview. I'd like to say to uh, our audience today uh, that uh, Professor Hayek has had his famous book, The Road to Serfdom, translated into 15 languages. 
Um, and the latest one, believe it or not, and here it is right here, it's been translated into, of all things, Russian. So all we need to do is find a way to get several million of these into the Soviet Union, and I think we'd be a lot better off. But I think that is fascinating, and I think it's a, a, a real commentary on the importance of, of uh, Professor Hayek's ideas to the future of Western civilization. Without uh, a true understanding of freedom and how important uh, non-intervention is, and without uh, a thorough understanding of Hayek's concept of spontaneous order as opposed to today's system where uh, mankind seems destined to repeat the mistakes of the past and try to inflict an artificial socialist order uh, on mankind. If, if that type of policies continue, then uh, we are in for some very, very bleak times indeed. But as we mentioned today in the interview, there's some very uh, encouraging signs. And I would ask everybody here today to make, give serious consideration to donating some money each year, some of your profits in your business or your investments each year, to, to the spread of Professor Hayek's ideas and other free market economist ideas at the various institutes in the United States and abroad. Thank you.